Johnny's voice is a distinctly American one. Many people have said that the phrase Huckleberry Friend reminds them of Huckleberry Finn and Mark Twain. Mark Twain was the original American novelist of the same landscape that Mercer went back to again and again and again. Stephen Foster wrote the great pastoral songs of longing and home and desire for home and all of that stuff that's also in Mercer's songs. By and by, hard times comes a knocking at the door, then my old Kentucky home, good night. The sounds of his childhood are all intermingled in the lyrics. Uh, down in the south, when I write about Moon River and the huckleberries along the banks of the river, and uh, or the cornfields or something like that. That's exactly how it used to be. Well, it isn't so much that way now. When we grew up, uh, Hoagie's 10 years older, so he grew up in the fields of Indiana, and I smell the fields of new mown hay and, and the light, candlelight glimmers through the sycamores. Well, yeah. that's exactly how it was. Now, who writes about railroads anymore? Trains don't go a hooey to hooey anymore. They go, eh, eh. Carmichael was not only a great singer-songwriter, he was also a pioneer of jazz and had worked with fellow Midwesterner Bix Beiderbecke. Beiderbecke had drunk himself to death a few years earlier at the age of 28. He was one of the most original instrumentalists in jazz history. Hoagie uh, had this tune and I couldn't think of what to write because it has this front line which is so pure and kind of classic and bucolic and in the middle is straight big spider back, sort of, you know. And in your lonely flight, haven't you heard the music of the night? Wonderful music, faint as a will o' the wisp, crazy as a loon, sad as a gypsy, serenading the moon. Oh, Skylar. It's kind of big, slowed down, you know, because if he played it, that's what fascinated me about the song and made it so tough to write. Oh, Skylark, I don't know if you can find these things, but my heart is riding on. If you see them anywhere, won't you lead me there? You know, he comes from the southern tradition of the, all those wonderful writers. Look at the novelists. Uh, you know, Flannery O'Connor and Faulkner, Faulkner um, and Eudora Welty. And, oh, you know, he's part of that. He really yeah. is. Harper Lee believe. and Truman Capote. Uh, Thurston Tennessee Tr Williams. Yeah. I mean. Georgia. Oh. <laughs> Nobody will ever forget. Georgia. Yeah, the world they grew. I'm probably your biggest fan, but I got to admit something. I didn't write Georgia. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I've been sending royalty checks to Hoagie Carmichael for years. Oh, you're putting me on, John. <laughs> oh, I, I wish I weren't, because I come from Georgia, and, oh, man, I'd uh, I'd love to sing some, something about it with you. Would you really? Yeah. All right, I'll tell you what. Come aboard. All right. Georgia. Oh, Georgia, 
There's this curious fusion of the African and the Irish and Scottish. Um, and uh, there's also a, such a strong improvisational tradition in the South, musically and otherwise. I said a Georgia, he said a Georgia, yes, he said Georgia. Just a song. summers, they would go out to a little coastal island called Vernon View, and my grandfather was uh, one of the founders of that island, and they had a house right on the water, overlooked the marsh, and it goes right past Pinpoint, where there was a fairly sizable African-American community, and a lot of the ladies there were shrimp and crab pickers, and he played with a lot of children there. Mercer's upbringing and background distinguished him from the great songwriters of New York. He grew up hearing the roots music of the South, blues, gospel, country, and jazz. Keepers, creepers, where'd you get those beepers? Creepers, creepers, now where did you get those eyes? Guys, oh, get up, how'd you get so lit up? Oh, gosh, I'll get up. I went with my wife one night to see a movie at Grandma's Chinese, and Henry Fonda played a farm boy in it. And he saw something, something impressed him in the movie. He said, Gee, Furs Creepers. Gee, Furs Creepers. And that just rang a little bell in my head. And when I wrote it, I wrote it down when I got out of the movie. And because, you know, Jeepers Creepers in America in those days was kind of, I think, a polite way of saying, Jesus Christ, you yeah, know, yeah. Jeepers Creepers. Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those eyes? Gosh, oh, get up, get up, get up. How'd you get so... There's a great tradition, isn't there, right up to the present day of using sort of uh, current phrases as song titles. You're halfway home if you've got a, a phrase that everybody knows. As a matter of fact, if it becomes well known, it's ripe to be a song. And I've done a lot of those. It's Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those eyes? The world that Johnny Mercer was born into a century ago was a settled one. There were conventions to be observed and a set of expectations of how a boy from a well-established family should grow up. I began to write at the tender age of 15, which, of course, all kids do now, but in those days, that was unheard of. I was so crazy about songs so early, I knew them all, and I didn't do it on purpose. I just knew these songs. I knew verses and second choruses. What was your father's reaction when uh, he saw you veering towards show business? I don't think he understood it. He, looked, he used to look at me and say, you must be a product of the age. He said, I don't know where you get that from. And I think he was right. I was a product of the gramophone and the radio, which started to come in on crystal sets. I can remember tuning in Schenectady and Cincinnati, you know, and following these bands and the singers with the bands and the songs. From Victor Herbert, I remember Kern had, uh, they didn't believe me yeah. when I yeah. must have been eight, ten years old. By the time I was 16, 17 years old, he had Showboat. And uh, Victor Herbert had all those songs like Slumber On, My Little Gypsy Sweetheart, and Rogers and Hart had 
you took advantage of me. And Gershwin had all those rhythmical shows like OK, Tiptoes. I loved them all. Yeah. I listened to every single one of them and could sing them, most of them, by heart right now. I don't think I could have gone any other direction, really. Not just too marvelous, too marvelous to work. Like glorious. Glamorous. And that'll stand by amorous. The scope of what Johnny Mercer created is dazzling. One of his favorite collaborators of the 1930s was Richard Whiting. One of the songs that they created that has become a great standard is Too Marvelous for Words. It was written for a movie called Ready, Willing, and Able, which starred Ruby Keeler. It's used in a production number in the film and then reprised at the end of the movie. Clearly, Mercer was having a great time writing this lyric because one of the words used in the song is apathistical. I had to look up the word apathistical, and I couldn't find it anywhere. Now, what on earth can that word be? Why don't you call him up and see? And I finally called a librarian at the LA Public Library who found that the last use of the word apathistical in a piece of literature was 1797. So he really dug in putting this one together. He was a man, in my view, that was dedicated to words and wanted people who he considered were good singers to go out to the world and, and send the message out that these words were wonderful. My grandfather had a realty business, and there was property in Florida. And this thing just went bust. Uh, and Johnny had to come home. Mercer had been due to follow in the family tradition and enroll at Princeton, one of America's most prestigious universities. That dream was over. In the first rumblings of the crash to come, land prices began to fall in 1927. The effect on the Mercer family was catastrophic. Rather than declare bankruptcy, Mercer's father chose to liquidate his company to protect his shareholders. Together with his personal savings, he used nearly all of his remaining assets to try and return their investments. He had $2,000 left, and he gave Johnny $1,000. He said, I'm going to pay all this back. Pop said, you have to make a lot of money, son, to pay this back. And he said, I'm going to do it. Mine's a hopeless case, but there's one saving grace anyone would feel as I do. Out of breath and scared to death of you. Love was first divine, then explored and defined. Still, the old sensation is new. Out of breath and scared to death of you. That was my first published song, and that was called Out of Breath and Scared to Death of You. And in that show is where I met Ginger, my wife. She was a dancer in the show, and I had a song in it. Johnny really wanted to be an actor. He had done some theater work and got very good notices, and he thought that was going to be his career. Actually, I don't think he realized that music was always more important than anything else. Dear, I thought I'd drop a line. Ginger Meehan was born Elizabeth Melcher the in Brooklyn cool. in 1909. Her parents changed their name. They were poor Jewish immigrants from Russia. Theirs was a world away from the debutantes that Mercer had dated back home in Savannah. He was madly in love with her. They were married in New York City. And then he sent a telegram to his mother and father that they were married. I think my grandmother was not appreciative of that particular thing. 